Welcome to the Behavioral View. everyone. Would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we'll tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Hi everyone and welcome to the Behavioral View. My name is Shannon Hill. I'm Editor-in-Chief at Central Reach Institute. And I'm Dr. Carrie Millico. I'm Director of Clinical Programming at CR. And I'm Nissa Van Etten. I'm the Director of Assessments and Clinical Training here at Central Reach. And we are very pleased today to have a special guest here to talk about trauma, compassion, and ABA. Would you like to introduce yourself, special guest? I sure would. Hi, I'm Dr. Dithu Rajaram. Um, I'm an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and the Director of Behavior Analysis Research at TRIAD, the Autism Institute at Vanderbilt Kennedy Center within Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, that's awesome. a mouthful, but thank you so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, universities like to have long titles for their faculty members. For, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we negotiated this job for two years because I said, I need more titles after <laughs> my name. <laughs> more <laughs> that, that letterhead must be really long. <laughs> <laughs> it's a landscape instead of portrait. <laughs> <laughs> we are super excited to have you here today, and we're going to dig into a little bit more about what you do there at triad but we like to start off with something a little bit fun and this time our question of the day is if i wasn't a behavior analyst i would be a blank mm. who wants to go first with that i can go I first <laughs> yeah because i'm not prepared for this sure yeah. <laughs> i have one more serious answer and one kind of goofy answer if i weren't if i wasn't a behavior analyst I think that I would have loved to have been in the filmmaking craft, mm. actually telling story. I know that in behavior analysis, we talk a lot about how the consequences of what we do matters a lot, but growing up, just th things that I consumed, content, whether it was movies or television shows, really shaped a lot of how I view the world, and I would have loved to contribute to that, to storytelling on that scale. As a more goofy one, this is something that, even though it's goofy, my partner and I really entertained it during the pandemic. Love to just throw it all away and start a South Indian food cart in an area where there might be yeah. demand for it, and then ultimately build a South Indian fusion cuisine empire in the United mm. States. Whole empire, I like it. So delicious. <laughs> yeah, if we're, as long as we're making it up, I'm going to be ambitious. Yeah, <laughs> I think you should. Start. Yeah. I have two that kind of parallel those, so I can tag on to that. I, cause I do think about it like eventually one day I am going to retire. It is going to happen, but I'm not a person who's just going to be happy with gardening and such. Although I, I like doing those things. I know I have to have something else all the time. And the original plan was to be a writer of some sort in the creative style. So maybe a novel one day, maybe just all I've got in me is short stories. I don't know, <laughs> but there will be some sort of written product that's creative and not just textbooky and sciencey. <laughs> got it. But I also do have plan B that if I don't have the staying power for that, I live in a very small town. We have a, the downtown where all the buildings are connected and everything. So I too have a dream of creating like a general store where you come in and buy flowers and potato chips and fabric. <laughs> Got it. Flowers, potato chips, fabric. Fantastic. Yeah. And you can park the food truck right out front. That'd oh, be yeah. Excellent. Oh, I see a collab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I was on track for like law school. Then I switched to psychology. I got some, I don't know, some advice uh, that was not supported. So I started questioning my abilities of going to law school. It's like, oh, you had to memorize case law. And I don't think that you could do that. And so I was like, eek. 
so no. from someone that I loved and trusted. So I like, I love psychology. Maybe I'll switch there. Now I have moments where I was like, oh, I wonder what that, that life would have looked like. But then I wouldn't have met my husband, wouldn't have had my kids. And I do love the life that I have. Lawyer, which I think also ties in with some of the advocacy work that I do. There's definitely reinforcers that are there. But if we're also playing also a fun job, <laughs> I, I also, I too love food, love food eating though. I love cooking. I also was thinking about being a chef for a while. And then I, I worked with the chef and his goal, he told me was, I'm going to make you not want to be a chef. <laughs> and that was then true. So I was like, I'm just going to throw great parties. So that's what I do. So I was thinking maybe like a, a food critic definitely could never be one. I think like the stakes are high for that. But one thing I love to do, and if you know, you're a good friend of mine or you conference with me, you know that I actually do a lot of research before I go to conferences about restaurants around the place. And I will make reservations and I always make reservations for a group of six. So that way I can always have people come with us and have not too large of a party because then that gets a little chaotic, but large enough parties. So you have different people that you're eating with at nice, fun restaurants. And speaking, I wonder if there would even be a space for a food blog of saying, okay, can we, we frequent these spots in the ABA community. Hmm. Here's where to go. Here's the wait times. Here's how fast in and out you'll be. There's, I, I don't know. Just, like if you, I don't know if there's any money around it, but yeah. I think it would be, might be fun to even just, uh, there's some places, at least Calab, where we go frequent the same spots off day is often in New Orleans. There's some places that we go often. Chicago is often the spot. There's tons of amazing restaurants there. So I don't know. I'm like, like, and I like traveling with you. Blog out of me. <laughs> I, know, I like traveling with you because I never have to think about that. I just get a text. <laughs> this place, this time. So yeah, I think it's just, a lot of my friends are just like, where are we going for dinner tonight? <laughs> That's so funny. I think you can be a concierge that. for all conferences where you just provide the service for people whenever you oh. get well, that, that that will have to come with a price tag. I, I mean, that, is a, that is a busy job. I'm always a job, though. Yeah. <laughs> That's making me hungry, too. I know. <laughs> it is lunch hour. Am I? Let's see. I Prior to ABA, and again, I got into the field in my teens, so I didn't really have it prior to, but really liked criminal psychology and the psychology behind it. And I think even now I have an interest in true crime and watching those updates and stories and trying to understand those behaviors that those individuals engage in. But if we're doing the fun one, I think truly fun, money didn't matter. I would be a dog walker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love walking my dogs. I love being outside. I just tie the leash around my waist and we just go wherever they want to go. And there's no time and the weather's perfect. That's one of my favorite activities. Oh, your, love it. Your dog does better on leash than mine, apparently. Because <laughs> yeah, just tying that in my waist. That's not working. <laughs> que question, did you ever conflate criminal psychology with behavior analysis? When I I've, there are a couple actually podcasts and groups that that review, especially the like right now the Idaho case is a big one. Mm. There are behavior analysts that are meeting to discuss these cases from a behavior analytic lens. And oh. I'm loving consuming those discussions and podcasts because there is a lot of, there's a place for us in those areas. And it's really interesting. For sure. yeah. I started doing my, one of my comps on looking at, I wanted to look at behavior of a serial killer, looking like in comparing oh. it to reinforcement schedules. Mm. Uh, but then it was getting too convoluted and I needed to graduate. Sure. So, I, I, so you I fired up that a, food blog. And you... <laughs> yeah, then I, yeah, then I was like, I, was <laughs> I taught like an undergrad uh, intro to behavior analysis class. And I would, I want to say that roughly 30% of every class came in and they're like, yeah, behavior analysis, the stuff from criminal minds. Cause I think, I think criminal it's criminal mind. minds or some yeah. show where the, the, the detectives minds. are called yeah. behavior analysts or behavioral analysts. And there's always a rude awakening mm -hmm. where I'm like, oh no, we're going back to the rat lab <laughs> folks. <Yeah. laughs> Quite as fascinating as those folks. Yeah. I know. Well, I guess we should go back. To face. <laughs> I guess we should go back to reality then. Do you mind giving us just a little bit of information about your work there at Vandermilt? Vandermilt. 
Of did course. They... I'd love to. Yeah. So I did give a mouthful, but it's easiest to say that I work for an organization called Triad that exists within Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And Triad it, it originally stood for Treatment and Research Institute for Autism Spectrum Disorders. Um, now, colloquially, we just refer to it as the Autism Institute. And it's a service line that was created within the Department of Pediatrics a little over 20 years ago to fulfill a, the need in Tennessee to provide diagnostic services for autism. So the organization actually started off without any ABA whatsoever. And then very quickly, you know, Tennessee is a state that ha where Nashville is a pretty big hub, where the medical center in Nashville does a lot has a big footprint across the state of Tennessee. So it very quickly became the place where that was doling out the most autism diagnoses in the state. And that very quickly led to what are we going to do with folks that now have diagnosis as of course, pre insurance boom, pre ABA boom. So triad developed relatively soon after that, they started to develop some services that they could offer to the newly diagnosed folks with autism. And what that has proliferated into over the past two decades is multiple service lines, some of which are connected to federal grants, like Department of Defense grants, and some of which are connected to state contracts that provide essentially wraparound assessment and intervention services for intellectual developmental disabilities across the lifespan from that early diagnosis all the way to transition to adulthood. So there's a lot there. And when I was interviewing for this job and trying to understand what it was, I definitely made it to the end and did not understand everything that Triad does. I still don't, but <laughs> my specific kind of role is to come in and try to take the various service lines, whether we're providing early intervention services in the home, providing capacity building services in terms of evidence-based practices for educators for autism in public school systems, serving high-risk students who are engaging a lot of challenging behavior in the public school systems. My job is to try to take all the incredible work that, that the folks are doing at Triad and try to turn it into disseminable research, try to create sustainable systems of data collection and, and question answering so we can not only be systematic about our approach, but that we can document our outcomes and ideally pivot a lot of these practices toward trauma-informed, compassionate, and neurodiversity-affirming care. And how did you begin to start pulling those things together? As in within ABA, huh? That's a yeah. terrific question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There were a couple of formative uh, steps that got me there. That, thank you for asking that question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about it right now and it's a nice little journey. I got, I was trained at a residential school for kids with very severe challenges, intellectually and developmentally disabled children and adolescents. And I was primarily serving kids who were in residential homes because they were too dangerous to, to live at, in their own home. They were engaging in high risk, high intensity, high frequency behaviors. And we were using the principles of ABA to try to address those things. But we also often relied upon physical management tactics as emergency procedures, but also as kind of part of our behavior reduction protocols. Maybe this is something that we can unpack later on, but a lot of ABA best practices, when we think about what's the best way to decrease challenging behavior and maybe increase some adaptive skills, they often incorporate physical management tactics and things of that sort. So then fast forward to when I started do doing my doctoral training under Dr. Greg Hanley, we, I was in a totally different setting, not a residential setting, a setting where there weren't those resources, the personnel, the staff, the equipment to follow through on our expectations, to teach kids through that sort of more heavy handed extinction based approach that really forced us to pivot our methods and our strategies. And I got trained on what we now refer to as practical functional assessment and skill based treatment procedures that took a little bit of that, of the heat away from the interaction and were a little bit more about kind of building trust between client and caregiver, client and behavior analyst or technician en route to teaching skills within challenging contexts. A couple of formative cases within those experiences really forced us to look even more in the mirror and say, whoa, even, in, even when we believe that we're doing a gentler form of ABA, there's still a little bit of coercion in there. There are still some standardized practices that, that seem mundane when you're coming up and that's just that's what you think ABA is but when you peel back a layer and you look out step outside of your own kind of bubble that those things can perhaps contribute to harm or, or negative experiences on the from the perspective of the participant of the client that we worked with easy example is that in when I was in a university clinic we were often closing the door for our sessions and we would try to get little timed sessions so we could collect some data 
And if children wanted to leave the room, we would say, oh, you can leave when the session's over. And there were some folks for whom that didn't fly. And we needed to look in the We could either go toward more of a restrictive response to that, or we could say, no, let's open the door and let them come and go. And so after we worked with a few cases where the children were had a strong set of language skills and were engaging in really sophisticated, challenging behavior that was evoked by really unique circumstances, that really got my group and Dr. Hamley's group to, to think broadly about how can we design assessment and treatment services on the comprehensively that are built around assent, that are built around rapport building, and that prioritize safety from start to finish. And I've, ever since I've been in, in graduate school, I've devoted my career to trying to develop and refine those trauma-informed and more compassionate approaches to care. I actually, I won't even say that they're more compassionate. I think a lot of the procedures that I've described earlier, even the ones that sometimes look ugly, come with a certain compassion. That is, we do it for with good intentions, yeah. but pivoting toward a more trauma-informed approach is a more recent. And then truly joining Triad. Triad is a group that has a strong reputation and history. Current, they're practicing what they preach in terms of neurodivergent aff diversity affirming care and bringing in community partners from the autistic community, autistic BCBAs, autistic allies to influence the way in which we are conducting ABA. So that's a, a relatively new uh, element of my professional development. I'm meeting at Calaba this past weekend. I met a bunch of autistic BCBAs for the first time who I now consider friends and just any and every conversation I have has improved my approach to practice and has changed my value set slightly about how and why we ABA. And I'll stop there. Okay. All right. Before we dive in, because uh, that was a lot of cool stuff and I know that we're all ready to jump in. I have to do a secret word. So the first secret word today is CATS, C-A-T-S. Just curious how many are going to show up today. We had one earlier. <laughs> we know. Yeah. Mojo has a friend. <laughs> I, I closed my door, but now I feel like I should open it to have Mojo come join and see a friend on screen. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to be very careful in this episode because everything that you're talking about is so near and dear to my heart. I'm going to have to keep an eye on this and Carrie and see when they're trying to get in here because your origins are very similar to my origins in working with adults in residential care, many of whom had very severe problem behaviors in terms of aggression and self-injury. And... I, I know that's still a sticking point with some people on ascent-based care. And as you said, it's I don't want to send the message that for people who are still relying on physical intervention a lot, that means that you're not compassionate. I know that many of the times the compassion is we cannot stand to see this happen, this person to hurt themselves. We certainly can't allow them to really cause damage to other people who are they are living with or who they are working with. I'm just curious if you can share a little about outcomes when you do make this switch. Are you finding that you're able to drastically reduce restraint for example, or dependence on psychotropic medications. Yeah, thanks so much for pivoting to the outcomes because those things matter a lot. I was fortunate to work on a study that we published last year in behavior analysis and practice that was a collaboration across a couple of different sites. One was a university-based clinic and one was an, actually in a public school setting in Nashville. And that was when I collaborated with folks at Triad long before I worked with them. And we conducted assessment and treatment processes that we embedded into something that we call the enhanced choice model. And this was, these were children who were being referred for really serious, dangerous, challenging behavior. All of them were on the verge of being kicked out of their current placement, whatever it was, whether it was preschool or public school, and they were hurting like siblings and same aged peers a lot. So there were, there's a lot of high risk there. And all five of the folks that we enrolled in this study were also particularly resistant to being physically guided or physically managed. So it was a non-starter for us to even entertain the possibility of procedures where we might try to guide them through some of the things we're trying to teach them. We did implement enhanced choice model procedures, which essentially involved the primary thing is that these learners can opt in or opt out of their therapy from treatment onward. 
So we do conduct functional assessments. We conduct functional analyses. There are several components to the way in which we conduct functional analyses that I think promote safety and that serve to minimize the amount of escalation we see in functional analysis. But then in that treatment component, our treatments are based upon differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors and extinction of challenging behavior. That's a, that's when we, when I talk about skill-based treatment, that's all it really is. We prompt certain skills, the skills of communication, the, sk the skills of coping with disappointment or tolerating disappointment, and the skills of cooperating during periods where you don't have the things that you want. And we shape those and we differentially reinforce those while not rewarding challenging behavior. But that can be really difficult for some kids because the challenging behavior has a strong reinforcement history. It's sometimes more efficient to just flip a table and then get the work out of your way than it is to learn some difficult skills and to have to sit while an adult teaches you and you don't really like that. So we created procedures that we call the enhanced choice model that allow children to opt in or opt out of that. They can come to the room where we have differential reinforcement. They could come to another space that we call a hangout space where they can have non-contingent reinforcement, like similar access to the reinforcers that were previously maintaining challenging behavior, but for free. Or they could lose, choose to get the heck out of Dodge and just say, see you later, I'm done for the day. And when we implemented this with five participants in that initial study, for all five kids, we saw the terminal outcomes that, that the teams wanted. In other words, we achieved the goals of the team in terms of reductions in challenging behavior and increases in those social skills, and particularly increases in cooperation under challenging contexts like academic context, self-care contexts, things of that sort. And we saw that in a process where there was virtually no dangerous behavior throughout the process. So by adding this extra element of, hey, you can come and go as you please, by adding in some extra choice-making opportunities throughout our treatments, which has a strong precedent in our literature, um, and by being just really careful about the way that we introduced new challenging expectations, we saw that these learners learned the skills that we wanted them to learn in those challenging contexts. And furthermore, at least in that first study, the five participants chose to participate in the therapy where we were systematically exposing them to challenging situations in 96% of opportunities, which we were very surprised by. There was a very recent replication in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis by Dr. Joey Stobitz and colleagues. That was three students, all with an emotional behavior disorders profile and highly combative in school and had really yet combative relationships with their teachers. And they saw very similar outcomes. All the kind of goals were met, problem behavior was reduced and children chose to participate in that therapy over 90% of the time on average. So what I take away from those two studies and the and related work, we have another study, my colleague, Dr. Holly Gover published something to address feeding challenges using similar procedures, is that when we offer assent during these transition states, during the periods where we're trying to change behavior, when we offer assent, we are able to, we don't have proof for this, but I think it contributes to decreases in challenging behavior throughout the process. If kids can just say, you know what, I'm not feeling it today and we allow them to, then we don't need to work through some of the tougher episodes. But B, that children are choosing to participate in our therapeutic processes, that there's something about just having the option to not do it, that actually makes kids go, you know what? It's not so bad. I can learn this thing today. Uh, so those are some of the outcomes. We're continuing to replicate these processes in schools. And there's even another kind of other set of procedures that I could talk about called universal protocols that, that have really been teaching us more about the value of assent and the value of giving choices and allowing individuals to opt out of the things that we want to teach them. All right. Secret word number two is dogs. D-O-G-S. Maybe there's a theme. Maybe there's not. Um, <laughs> My um, friend had works with a learner who is non-speaking and uses devices to communicate and was, we were talking, this was a few months ago, and this learner is very young and showed like tons of aggression across to other providers and to peers to engage in simple tasks in a preschool set. When just given the autonomy to choose to participate and they, what they did is that they set up those little buttons that you can do fun little recordings on and just even that little intervention, they saw 
an increase in, in on task behaviors by letting the learner himself choose his own schedule. And so he would come up, he would smack one of those little things and says, I want to work. And then he would, and then he would say like when he was ready to actual, actually engage with the demand and he was like, and he would say, go. And, and then they would start delivering the SDs and all that kind of stuff. And then he would have another response and then he would say that he was done, but he would just, it was the coolest thing to see play out of how he was just like managing. And then he was, but it was all on his own accord and beautiful, drastically dropped any sort of aggression and just by letting him actually Thank manage you. himself. Yeah. And I think that in addition to presenting choice, but also maybe enrolling the learner, if they have that sort of, if, if you're able to get them enrolled in to say, okay, what does this learning condition look like? Mm -hmm. So if you are opting in, okay, so this is, if this is our learning condition, what elements in here do you, are you cool with? So not only assenting to working, but assenting to the process, the procedures yeah. in which like I can pick goal formation for you. Okay. You want this, but how does this look for you to make this even better? I think including all of those things, then we're making the treatment for them, right? We work yes. for our learners. We're enrolling them in that. And so now we're setting up the stakes, right? So that way everything is, is for their liking, as opposed to us being like, no, I'm the expert. This is top down. I You're right, Carrie, in that it is. It's super cool to see it happen. And it it, it just, it, if you're really into this, it is amazing to see it occur. The thing that I think I struggle with the most, and I'm really interested to hear what everyone has to say about preparing the environment that they're going back into, because so much of what we're talking about and did the, you're in the South with me, <laughs> yes. Miss, you're in Texas, Carrie, you have, and I'm not trying to pin anything on the South and say that we're less ready for this, but there is just more of a, should. Of a paternalistic okay. culture mm -hmm. here where there are rules and everyone should do them because this is the way we do them. And you should do what I say, because I want it's you to do that. Culture. Yeah. And we're, the goal is to get everybody back into the natural environment. So what do we do to prepare that environment that they're going to once they walk out of the therapy session? That's a great question. Is it all right if I share some thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah, am I lagging? Okay. I think to, I was thinking when Carrie was telling that story that throughout history, when we'd hear story, stories like that at the anecdotal level, or somebody has some data, our job as researchers would be, let's capture this so that we can find the science Chase behind it. it. What, yeah, what is this independent variable of providing choices leading to increases in cooperation and decreases in challenging behavior? In this case, with choice making in particular and providing choices and especially like allowing people to influence the, the development of treatment planning, we have an abundance of literature that exists. Folks in the PBIS sphere have been doing antecedent-based choice-making interventions for a long time. We've seen these effects. So that's exciting. If there's one potential shortcoming, I think it relates exactly to what you're pointing out now, Shannon, is that offering choices here in, in context A is great, but what happens in context B when those choices aren't available? What happens when you go back to the general ed classroom and you can't have those choices? And I think that the best way that we can protect against that as behavior analysts is to, in that context A, when we are offering as many choices as we reasonably can, we practice opportunities to not have those choices or we practice the skill of tolerating not being given a choice or not having your choice granted in the moment. Because that gives children skills that they can export to new environments, not just children, sorry, that gives our learners skills that they can export to new environments, skills like coping, skills like being resilient, skills like self-advocating in, in those moments. So to me, I think that we can look at this, the concept of assent and its relationship to ABA through a couple of different lenses. I do agree with you, Shannon, that it's going to be a while until we create a world that is truly accommodating of all needs and learning styles and preferences. And it's, and we do have to, to reconcile the reality that there are environments where those things aren't there. So in the present, we do need to, to teach children skills to navigate these more challenging contexts, but on the other side of the coin, 
when we are as behavior analysts going in and implementing things in the name of ABA, we need not have those procedures be devoid of any assent considerations, be devoid of any opportunities for individuals to opt in, opt out, weigh in on whether or not they like the way that they are being treated. So I don't see those things as mutually exclusive. I believe that we can accomplish both aims and we can um, prepare individuals for their terminal context by having an understanding of what that context looks like and by trying to bring that into this, this safer, perhaps more gentle world where learners are opting into those challenges. A thousand percent. The conversation of Brown Ascent includes teaching resilience and perseverance. Like yeah. it's not just, it's not just, okay, you also have to start someplace, but it doesn't mean that like once, once we teach that the repertoire is done, right? Yes. yes. My question is strictly about, I think, I feel like there needs to be some training of the context that they're going into so that we don't squelch those skills that they've just learned. Sure. And, then, and also, but there's also cultural sensitivity yeah. in that not all people can say no at the same type of degree in the same type of context. So if we, you have a black adolescent male is not going to say no in certain contexts because that may result in very much harm to oh his body and or his agency and his freedom as a white woman in in the same way let alone their diagnosis so there is some contextual things and cultural variables that need to be considered in in teaching all of this stuff around ascent and not to mention what is also valued around families like our good mm -hmm. colleague Kristen used to work with families in hong kong and in, there was many times in Kristen's one of, she's done ascent work for the last 20 years and one that just published a paper on it. And, but yet those families are like, no, no, that, that is not what occurs in our household. But, and, and that's something that you have to respect that family culture, right? It's not necessarily for us to be like, the yeah, clinician yeah. thinks that you should run your family yeah. this way. No, we need to also respect what is happening in the home. We can talk about some of the benefits of how your child will respond under certain conditions. And, but it is also like, we need to respect different cultures and different values in different homes and different settings. And it is a rich, deep conversation and nuance that requires tons of research of which we just are dipping our toe in with respect to our own field. And we need to branch out and look in the literature outside of our field, but it is deep that extends so many branches. And I think as practitioners, we need to understand what we're looking at when we see these types of behaviors occurring. I know like your story, Carrie, was a very clear example of how in the session you could identify the different choices and how that learner could respond. I, it made me think of a learner I used to work with where he had a robust language skill set, but in moments of distress, frustration, mm -hmm. those, that language skill set wasn't able to come out. It was just survival. So giving him a way to communicate in that moment, he would write, so he would write, I don't want to, no, or then we gave him the option of, okay, write the choice that you would like. What is it that you would like to do in this moment? And having that conversation with parents as when you're going out into the community and he begins to engage in these behaviors that cause distress to you as well, bring that whiteboard, give him the option to communicate to you, this is what I would prefer to do. This is the direction I would like to go. I think it's understanding that there are so many different ways that these behaviors will occur and teaching individuals in the different contexts, communities, families, what they're looking for. And then also back to your point, Carrie, that having the conversation with the family on what culturally is significant to them. If this is a non-negotiable, how do we support teaching your child to work through this? Because Absolutely. for your family, this is something that you're going to be following through on, even if we work through that in the clinical setting. And one of the things that when you were speaking this, I was thinking about is, it, helping people in the schools, especially, but this is where I ran into it, but also true in residential communities. When the behavior that we're working on is very scary, convincing those folks that it is good and preferable to work on practicing that skills in situations where everything is calm, where, when we're not dealing with it right now, but to bring it, to build that repertoire while it's calm so that they can use it, that you cannot teach this during the episode. 
scary, the scary part. Mm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so I, while I love and I am fascinated by, and I agree in a hundred percent raw on everything that we do in those sessions, I still always worry about, but maybe it's because of years of having the beeper. Remember beepers or any of you old enough for beepers? <laughs> years oh, I definitely of- had a beeper. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was a crystal. Yes. Yes. text like kisses with the letters. Yes. <laughs> yes. Numbers. I- all the numbers I'm were so always like a phone number and 911 on the end of it. <laughs> they're out of the session, but they're and they haven't learned all of those skills yet. And so helping the teacher, helping the direct care staff, helping the I didn't I never worked directly with families this way, but families who are working in this area and living the life while we're teaching those skills, uh, acknowledging that while we're here to talk about the trauma-informed delivery of services to the direct recipient, there's a lot of trauma in the lives of people who are surround, who are surrounding that person. And sometimes that trauma has been inflicted by the service recipient. And we can't overlook that we're sometimes asking them to work through that. So pivot a little bit. We've talked all around trauma, but we haven't actually addressed it head on. And I know that's part of the reason that that we brought you here today to do so. Thinking about trauma as a diagnosis and the boundaries of us working with that as behavior analysts. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I'll start by saying that I have very little expertise in trauma as a diagnosis. That is like post-traumatic stress disorder. And and I, frankly, I've been writing a little bit about trauma and trauma-informed care. And I don't think that I have gotten to a point in my evolution where I think that we should be experts in PTSD. I think that those currently the evidence-based practices for PTSD are a little bit outside of the behavior analytics sphere. But I do feel that we have a lot to learn from the trauma literature and from a conceptualization of trauma, particularly through a behavior analytic lens that can really impact our practice. And I'll come back to the example, Shannon, that you just mentioned a second as the perfect example of what role trauma-informed care can play in ABA. So when we talk about trauma in the psychological sense, Common definitions, we'll talk about it as as resulting from an event or series of events that can have lasting impact on our emotional, spiritual, physical, behavioral well-being. And the all definitions are leave something to be desired for us behavior analytic nerds who want operationally defined everything and we want examples and non-examples. They're deliberately vague, but I think it's because I think that the vagueness jives really well with the behavior analytic perspective, which is that any kinds of events that an individual experiences, it do, they don't have to have take on a specific name or specific topography. Any event can have a lasting impact on our behavior in the future. We just call those interactions with stimuli. Sometimes we call those conditioned reflexes or conditioned or trained operants, what have you. And any response that is a result from some type of what we might call a potentially traumatic event could be a show of post-traumatic stress. So It's helpful to distinguish distinguish between things that we call potentially traumatic events, things that happen to us, either in childhood or as we grow up, and post-traumatic stress symptoms, which are our behavioral, our phenotypes, the ways in which we react in the presence of those events. Events and behaviors, that is a beautiful place for behavior analysts to get their hands dirty, to talk about what are, what's the relation between this event and this behavior. But the truth is, in 2023, we don't have a proper functional analysis of any individual's trauma. Is when, when we find out that somebody has post-traumatic stress, we don't know that these events are caused. Like We don't have the functional relation between the post-traumatic stress and the post-traumatic events. We still talk about it in a bit more of a qualitative sense. Like when folks get screened for post-traumatic stress, they go fill out verbal reports. They fill out questionnaires that say, I had such and such experiences when I was younger. Oh, and now I have such and such symptoms. So even folks in in the mainstream world who aren't receiving ABA services, who have post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder, report that they have some behaviors in the presence of some events. That actually does bring us back to what ABA does well, is we understand what are the events or what are the conditions in which certain behaviors are more likely to occur than not. So I'll try to land this plane. 
Behavior analysts who work with folks who engage in challenging behavior like self-injury, aggression, destruction, folks who cry a lot, disproportionate maybe to the circumstances and, and engage in tantrum behavior. We may, it may be useful to view those things as potentially as post-traumatic stress symptoms, which may help us look out in the current environment for things that might be connected to potentially traumatic events. And if we can just assume because the data are somewhat insurmountable that children with intellectual developmental disabilities are at a much greater risk for having experienced post potentially traumatic events in their childhood. Children with weaker language skills almost never report the trauma that they may have experienced. It is helpful for us to maybe approach our ABA by assuming that the individuals we serve may have experienced some potentially traumatic events in their childhood, something like abuse, something like neglect, something like witnessing violence, something like housing insecurity, relationship insecurity, instability. These are the kinds of events that may contribute to post-traumatic stress. And when we are tasked with addressing an individual's challenging behavior, the procedures that we choose in the name of ABA and in the name of trying to help decrease those challenging behaviors can lie on a continuum from, of either trauma mitigating or trauma exacerbating. And that is what we talk about when we talk about trauma-informed care, is the selection of ABA procedures that are more likely to mitigate the impact of trauma, the symptoms of trauma, as than they are to exacerbate symptoms of trauma. So if I'll bring that up, now I am landing the plane, I hope. If I bring it back to your example, Shannon, if we're saying we don't want to teach learners in periods of their escalation, that is a place where ABA in its, it, it, at the core principles of behavior analysis might suggest when an individual is engaging in challenging behaviors, the best thing we can do for them is put that behavior on extinction. Do not reward it, do not attend to it, do not give the things to them, because that is how we decrease the behavior from a scientific perspective, from a data perspective. That is also how we help this person. We should recognize that if an individual has experienced events where us ignoring them and us not giving them the things is more likely to exacerbate those symptoms, the behaviors, that we might be engaging in trauma exacerbating practices, as opposed to exactly what you said, Shannon, in that moment, shut it down, give them what they want, make sure that their needs are met, live to teach another trial, live to, to have a relationship with them the next day so that they'll allow you into their home again. Those are procedures that might err toward trauma mitigating as opposed to trauma exacerbating. So there was a presenter at Calaba who who received ABA therapy and talked about experiencing planned ignoring and talked like it was a core memory. And I can't tell you how many times I've used that as an intervention. Yep. That was a part of the tool of my tool belt. Sure. And I, like, that was, that, that ran deep, right? Knowing and hearing what they went through. One thing that I struggle with, not with recognizing that I can, that I, my, my heart heard what they said, but is what I is when I see people and I hear people then try to say other people's experiences are not trauma because they weren't, because they didn't, they weren't a part of what we colloquially could then classify as trauma. You weren't raped. Right. Uh, I think we all can maybe get on board with rape being a traumatic event. I don't know. There's probably some people out there who probably don't put that in the bucket, but I think like majority of people can put rape in a bucket and say, if you weren't, you didn't maybe, you weren't, you didn't go to war. There's some areas in which I think we all can get on board and say those were traumatic events. But I think that there's some places where people are like, okay, that was a traumatic event for me. And then I saw you present on something where you said something that was like three to four ACEs leads to some really scary statistics yeah. for increases in suicide and really significant deteriorating health conditions for individuals. Only three to four ACE events for an individual can lead to really detrimental life experiences and health, health, mental health, and just physical health. Yeah. Do you mind if I share so some of those? That makes me want to be like, I don't want to 
make, I don't want to jeopardize anything. Exactly. I want to protect as a mother, as a therapist, as someone who works with humans, as a boss. Yeah. I want to do anything I can do. So like, like I, so to me, when we were talking about trauma before versus trauma assumed or just anything, obviously leave with trauma assumed because I'm never going to like, how many aces do you have under your belt? Right. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to contribute to that number at all. But right. also just so like I, I, multiple things in my, my, my statement slash question, but when I have a really hard time with somebody saying, yeah, that wasn't a traumatic event. One, we actually have no idea what people are dealing with and how they interact with those contingencies and those those variables and how given past events, what shows up for them is something that may be mundane to you, but not to them. And how that compiles and like, God, what freaking number is that for them? And how that shows up for the rest of their life. Yep. That's exactly right. Behavior analysts, for good reason, are grounded in empiricism and determinism. So we have historically been like, if I don't see it, it I shouldn't just I shouldn't just assume that something is occurring. That makes sense in a lot of cases. Here's why we, I've been talking a lot about adverse childhood experiences and potentially traumatic events. As, as you said, Carrie, there's some correlational data out there that is shocking. The correlation does not is, is about individuals who have just lived through have had potentially traumatic events happen to them. It's not even about the fact that they've had mm -hmm. potential post-traumatic stress symptoms. It's not about their reports right. of symptoms. Just having lived through the potentially traumatic events of abuse, neglect, sexual violence, uh, witnessing violence, economic hardship, food instability. As you said, Carrie, if they have four or more, they're at a three times greater risk for lung cancer and heart disease, seven times greater risk for alcoholism, alcohol abuse, five times greater risk for being experiencing depression, a 12 time risk of suicidal behavior. And the, to me, the real kicker is they're, they are on average, they are, they have a 20 year decrease in life expectancy due to all cause mortality, not due to trauma, not due to traumatic stress, just due to all other associated health risks. These are data that come from Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who's like a leading ACEs researcher and, tra and trauma researcher outside of behavior analysis. But I think it sets the stage, Carrie, as you did really well, it sets the stage for the, how high the stakes are. And again, one of my earlier points when we started talking about trauma is that we are not responsible for all the trauma that happened to an individual in their past life. We meet people at various sure. stages in their life. Sometimes we meet them at age three, sometimes we meet them at eight, nine. We don't know what happened. And sometimes we're not gonna know. We don't, we're not necessarily equipped to get accurate information about their past. But the question is this, is then exactly what you said, Carrie, do we want to be contributing to one or two or more of those potentially traumatic experiences in the name of ABA, in the name of helping them? And that number is so small. It's not, the cat has nine lives. We're not going to help. We're not going to help. And yeah. it's, and knowing that we work with a very vulnerable population who will, we see, we also see the stats on sexual abuse or physical abuse as well and being close to a family member or trusted like like we we cannot leverage ourselves to be like i'm going to i'm going to contribute that in in the because it will help i just can't i when you said four i my jaw dropped and that hasn't that's just been right here same. Just, it, it blew my mind. To, just so I can be I, make sure I'm clear, yeah. the statistic about a 20 year decrease in life expectancy is correlated with having experienced six or more potentially traumatic events. Okay. But all the other outcome, health, but, negative health like, outcomes are four goodness. or more. Yeah. yeah. But still, oh my goodness. And I, I want to interject something here too. And this is one of those things I feel like gets said a lot, but like you're saying, Carrie, sometimes you hear it at the right time of the right moment in the right words, and it just hits you right in your heart. This is, I don't like the term general population because the general population is full of people who have had very awful experiences, mm -hmm. but this is mostly coming from people working with people who can speak the and who that will we're talking about? i have yeah yeah and i have an i have another little world that i circulate in with domestic violence and the number of children who will not say that these things have happened 
and the number who cannot say that these these things have happened is staggering and horrible. But also, what about just the effects of if you've ever been in a place where you're the only person who speaks the language you speak and you can't get your point across? That's not even something that is counted as an adverse childhood event, but how much stress and frustration that your body must be going through on a day-to-day -day basis when you just can't even make anybody sure. understand what you need, what you want, and how you feel, what your preferences are. So I'm 100% in the category of we're not trying to treat post-traumatic stress disorder right. by acknowledging that people have had experiences that are going to make them respond in differential ways to the procedures that we or may not use. And if there is a kinder and gentler way, why would you argue for not using that? If that's available, even if the person hasn't experienced a traumatic mm -hmm. event, why would you choose not to? And are there situations where you would choose to use something that is more frustrating to a learner than another method? Maybe there is, but I want to kick that out there to you guys. It's been in the sake of we can get there faster, or this is has more research behind it, it's documented in the literature, or it's easier for the implementers. I also think it leads back to your comment, Carrie, where people are assuming trauma is this big event that had to occur that everybody agrees this is the definition of mm -hmm. trauma, whereas but trauma is very much... That's not even a real thing because no. you guys know how I feel about the DSM, but I know what it says and it never says that. You can have PTSD because of chronic exposure to lower level events. So I don't even know where that's coming from. Yeah. I think it's just like a lay person's, I've gotten into like just full blown out right. like <laughs> disagreements yeah. with other highly esteemed professionals around <laughs> what is considered trauma. Like oh, I'm trying I'm to, with you. Part yeah, back, back when I used to engage in these Facebook conversations that I no longer <laughs> try to do, but it's just good call. Yeah, I hate <laughs> sanity purposes, but it's just like you can't, you really can't, you don't know how a person responds to those stimuli. You don't know their right. extensive history. Part of it's, it could be, it's a, not for us. part of it could be a relic of our scientific traditions that is throughout um, history. We've aimed to find out the variables that are necessary for behavior change and the variables that are sufficient. And we've often erred on the side of only do that, which is necessary and, and no more. So we've studied mm -hmm. the principles of behavior analysis, reinforcement, extinction, and punishment. We found that yes, you can move the needle with certain behaviors in particular directions. Trauma-informed care comes along as a set of strategies and practices. Trauma-informed care is not itself a behavioral process. We're likely right. never going to have a study where trauma-informed care is the independent variable that results in behavior change. In order to be conceptually systematic, we need to look, dig deeper and say, what influenced the behavior change at the level of behavioral process, reinforcement, extinction, stimulus control, what have you. So I think that that might be where, from a cultural perspective, our field has been hesitant to say, no, we're not just going to tack on five additional procedures. That might be cumbersome. Those procedures have not been demonstrated to be functionally related to this behavior change. And I think that's where I see some pushback. We, I, we heard it, there was a beautiful poll of, of autistic BCBAs and neurodivergent like allies at, at Calaba. And there was an individual who asked a question that was like, my, my colleagues won't allow us to engage in neurodiversity affirming practices because they say it's not evidence-based, that there's yeah. no evidence base behind it. Do you remember that, Carrie? Were you in that panel? Yeah. It, it's a really, those are the kinds of conversations that, that bring, that, that make me think, what's the alter of evidence upon which we worship. For throughout history, we've yeah. worshiped at the altar of behavioral data evidence, of seeing the decrease, seeing the reversal, and seeing it go back and saying, okay, now I believe something. But what we're, I think we're shifting toward believing the lived and perceived experiences of individuals, believe them when they say that, the, that these yeah. stimuli are traumatizing for them, believe them when they say that their experience of planned ignoring was a core memory. Rather than say, I'll believe it when I see the data points, we should probably just believe lived experiences and then behave accordingly so that we don't contribute to the trauma. 
Mm-hmm. Social validity has been, the idea of social validity has been around for a very long time as well. And I know that we have struggled trying to make that into some sort of checklist or whatever. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what field you're in. If you're a behavior analyst, if you are an osteopathic surgeon, if your recipient of your treatment doesn't want it, yeah. <laughs> then you have to do something to make it more acceptable, period. I guess it's not period. It's period for me and my, that's my line of sympathy. And I just don't think like neurodiversity, affirming care, trauma-informed care, those things, we, it's not, it's not behavior analysis. It is behavior analysis. It's just how we leverage behavior analysis in the like different we're still using shaping we're still using reinforcement mm-hmm. like how are we using our tools to be in alignment with those values exactly it's nothing exactly different right. it's not like you, so you can be the like, position in the world but if you're an asshole when i come to your office i'm not coming <laughs> back That's right. exactly I didn't to do a procedure with no anesthesia i didn't no. say no. okay i left right. exactly it's the same it's the same concept as far as i'm concerned i think this is the first episode that we've actually started screaming um, <laughs> where's our soapbox <laughs> yeah oh i'm standing on it collective Sorry. TED talk thank you thank you for coming to our show. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah i'm gonna bring it back down by saying the last <laughs> I'm going to bring it back down by saying the last secret word cats and dogs were the first one anybody want to guess what the third one is Oh, don't have it be birds. <laughs> no, it's my favorite zoo animal of all time. The red panda. Oh, so a red panda are the third. Yeah. Awful cute. Yeah. Talking about a generation dealing with their own trauma. <laughs> Y'all saw the movie. Oh, seeing like every Pixar movie red. now, every uh-huh. Disney movie. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. All right. Dithi, thank you so much for joining us today. I did want to save a little bit of time here at the end just to say we're going to be airing this episode in June. So is there anything coming up over the summer that, that people should know about you, your work, where you'll be, what you'll be presenting, anything like that? In well, June. Go ahead, Carrie. Or there. No, after. sorry. No, you go for it. You go for it. <laughs> Got to think okay. in the future. You got any promises that <laughs> you're going to make? Yeah, I don't. I like to plan things like a few minutes ahead of my life at a time. But I believe I'm really excited that I'll be going, going up to, to Babbitt in the Northeast, in New England in October. And I'll be talking about advocating for trauma-informed care there. My group triad, we're doing some statewide trainings surrounding FBAs and BIPs, how to make sure that they're legally compliant, but also how to create some what we call advanced FBAs, th- things that might lead to to better effectiveness in the BIPs that folks are planning in school settings. I'm not sure if that's relevant to, to all the listenership, but if you are in the state of Tennessee, check out Triad at VUMC. And uh, I guess the last thing, I, if, if you don't mind me shamelessly plugging, like Triad is hiring. We're looking for behavior analysts to help us consult, particularly in, in public school settings across the state of Tennessee, working with who are, who we, who are high risk, who are being restrained and secluded a lot and where we have a lot of work to do to try to help repair their relationship with their schools and get them coming to school for longer hours and engaging with the things that their peers are engaging with. This is some of the clinical service work that we do. And my job, like I said earlier, is to try to embed those processes into research questions. So if you're somebody who's interested in mentorship in practical functional assessment, skill-based treatment, universal protocols, how to consult to to build capacity in, in school systems, please feel free to email me or Google us at triad at Vanderbilt. And we would love to, to build a, we're building a squad down in Nashville folks. And I'm very excited about that. I'm very proud of the team that I, I love it. For. And we'll put all of that contact. Information. We'll make sure all of that is, is stored with the episode so that people can find it fairly easily. So thank you. It for sounds that. like you are building quite the squad. You guys are going to have the dream team for sure. Uh, very oh. cool. Very needed. Uh, yeah. When, yeah. Uh, Thank you. We're so, I'm, I've made some great friends and colleagues already, and we're particularly interested in hiring neurodivergent autistic BCBAs to join our teams and help us ensure that our procedures remain aligned with what the community wants and that they are truly neurodiversity affirming. So the future awesome. is bright, I hope. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Love that. 
Carrie Nissa, got anything to kick out there for summer? Fingers crossed, I might be going to Nashville for Weba. Hey. Um, yeah, I'm going, I'm actually in the process of, we are filming this before it airs. And I'm writing my abstract now to hopefully present on some of this parent training stuff that we're doing that I'm really proud about. And we're taking a a new approach to parent training that I think is more holistic in alignment with the values that we have. Yeah. So by the time that we becomes around, we'll have some data, we'll have some cool stuff to present and hopefully it's accepted and we'll be able to share it with the attendees at Weba. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fantastic. If not, then you in what? Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that part out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can fix that in post, <laughs> but I doubt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How about you, Nissa? I'm living it one week at a time right now. That is so far in advance. <laughs> you can't think that far ahead. I've been using this as just trying to get the word out of what's available to see our Institute folks. So if you are in our catalog, one of the things that I've been trying to get going for years that we now are finally doing is it's called CR readings. So we have a pretty deep bench of behavior analysts at Central Reach, and I have talked many of them into choosing a reading of some sort, and we're going to create a course around it with guided questions, and you get to hear that person's thoughts on how they would answer those questions. Ooh, that's exciting. Cool. Wow. That's a very cool. Yeah. Anyway, Dipper, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a passionate talk today. <laughs> For it's sure. Fun. I thoroughly I enjoyed this. that. Thank y'all for getting passionate with me. I like that you're incorporating the y'all already. So <laughs> you're becoming a person. That was my first lesson in, in moving to the South. Learn how to say y'all. <laughs> y'all and barbecue, then you're ready to go. All right, guys. Thank you. And join us next time on The Behavioral View. Thanks for watching this episode of The Behavioral View. To get your CEU, follow the link in the instructions below. You can then go to the attendance verification quiz where you'll enter in the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate. If you've already done the work, you may as well get the credit.